Let's do this. And so a quick reminder, these first few weeks, I'll remind you this uh, at the beginning of each lecture. But I'm in the lecture channel on Discord. If you have questions during lecture, feel free to hit me up there. We also have some, uh, some TAs watching the Discord. They can answer your chat in, uh, in their live during lecture. Or I can answer it uh, up here live. Or the old-fashioned raising your hand works perfectly well, too. So I hate that I can't dim the lights in this room. It's blinding. It's messed with my head. Um, so let's get started. We got a lot to cover. We got to introduce Scala and get through Scala syntax. These first few lectures, these first couple of weeks, are going to go at a pretty quick pace as I'm effectively going through modules one and two of 115, but in Scala. So I'm going to go through a lot of syntax. I assume that you're familiar with the programming concepts that I'm covering, and I just need to show you how to do those things in Scala. So it will go fairly quick. And I'm going to start with a, a pretty quick demo. So next week's lab is going to be all about setting up IntelliJ, cl uh, cloning repos, and getting started with the projects. Uh, so this demo, I'm going to do a lot of that right now, but I'll do it very quickly. Next week's lab, you'll have two hours with the TAs to be able to get all this uh, set up. And the document is live. You can go through what you're going to go through in next week's lab ahead of time. I want to make sure you have this information early because we do have that first expected deadline, Project 1, Task 1, next Wednesday morning. Uh, so there's not a lot of time to get to that first expected deadline. Things start pretty quick in this course. So with that, we have the first project posted. I'm not going to go through the project itself right now. It's all about Pale Blue Dot, our beautiful planet, and excuse me, and the, uh, the cities. We have uh, city population data and parsing that data and trying to figure out information about certain uh, regions of the globe. What I want to focus on right now is we have a link to get to the starter code. I just want to go through the logistics of the process of starting this, uh, starting the project and submitting to Autolab. I had a little issue demoing this in the previous lecture, so if it doesn't go 100%, you know, uh, I don't have my hopes too high. But you have this link to get to the repository. When you go to this for the first time, it'll ask you to accept the project. I've already done that, so it has the, the or accept the assignment. I already did that, so it has a repository set up for me. That's my repository for the project, where I'll work on my code. You'll each have your own repository in GitHub Classroom. If you don't have a GitHub account, it'll ask you to create one, and then go into the classroom and start the assignment. Once you have the assignment, you'll be able to have your own repository. When you're there, you want to go to code and copy this link. Then when you have IntelliJ set up, you'll download IntelliJ, set it up with the proper JDK and SDK, the proper versions. And then you'll go to git clone, which is going to copy all of the starter code onto your laptop, into your IntelliJ, and paste that link that you copied from your GitHub repository. Then you'll click Clone. It'll ask you to log in. This is the issue that I had. It wasn't uh, authenticating the way I want it to. Hopefully it works right now. Uh, but I had a student ask about this after lecture, and they were having the same issue. So it's something I got to deal with now, or TAs get to deal with. Hopefully, uh, is resolved quickly. Repository uh, not found. Not going to mess with it right now. But um, uh, so once you have the code cloned, you'll be able to see all of the code for the project, the starter code, and where you're going to write your code. And IntelliJ has an amazing feature, which, uh, which I've grown addicted to. I don't like using programs without it, but it autosaves. So you just work on your code. It'll autosave as you're working, which uh, I guess is pretty common now. Uh, the days of having to remember to save are pretty much gone in most programs. Anyway, it'll autosave your code. And when you're ready to submit to Autolab, this is a little different based on your operating system. For some Windows, uh, for some reason, IntelliJ for Windows does this a little bit differently. But I'll go to File, Export, and Project to Zip File. That's going to take your entire project and just put it into one zip file. 
and you'll remember where you put that zip file. Go to Autolab, the first link on the course website. Go to Project 1, Task 1. Affirm that you did not cheat. Submit, and then choose that zip file that you downloaded your project to. So make sure you remember where you exported that zip file to and submit the correct latest version of your code as that zip file. Uh, it's a fairly common office hours question where, uh, where somebody's go, a student's going insane, like uh, Autolab is just telling them the same feedback every time, and I double check the zip files, and they're submitting an old zip file. It happens, it's fine. Um, but uh, hopefully I can save a few of you some frustration by reminding you right now. Make sure you're submitting that latest zip file. Once you submit, you'll get some feedback, which will look like this. I'm not going to explain the feedback right now. There is a Piazza post explaining it if you want to read up on it. Uh, but if you get all smiley faces, that's all good. And you'll get a 1 if you've completed all of these subtasks, or a 0, meaning uh, that you still got some more work to do. Once you get that 1 for completion, that is just a 1 or a 0, once you get the 1 for completion, you're done with that task. You never have to think about it again. You can move on to the next task. That's a very quick uh, explanation of how, uh, how the logistics work. Uh, this Piazza post, which I gotta, I gotta yell at TAs a bit. Uh, this Piazza post does now link directly to the Piazza post with the office hour schedule. It looks pretty sparse. It's only got one hour on it, which is tomorrow at 11 a.m., which will be my office hours on Zoom. That post will tell you how to get into the Zoom meeting and all that. Uh, so you can check out my office hours tomorrow if you want help getting up to speed and make sure you don't miss that first expected deadline. Or hopefully the TAs will start adding their office hours. And uh, I haven't told, I haven't asked them to yet. It's something uh, I just got to do. But uh, TAs, get your office hours in there and we'll load up that office hour schedule. As the TAs start adding their hours, the, uh, the schedule will start filling up pretty well. We should have office hours at most reasonable times throughout the week uh, once they all add theirs. Okay, back at that, talked about everything I wanted to talk about there. Let's start talking about content. All right, any questions about logistics of the course, assignments? Any, uh, yeah, what's up? Not this week, next week. Uh, would it be an AI violation if we use our own code from last semester? So I personally do allow this. It is against the university policy, but I do allow it in my classes if you want to use your old code from last semester. Uh, but you, you need to understand how that code works. Like if you still understand the code, I don't see any reason in having you retype it all. Uh, so I allow you to use it. But you've got to understand what it does uh, if you're going to do that. I think that policy is more for like English classes. Like you can't turn in the same essay. You'd have to write a brand new essay. But when it's code that, especially if I'm reusing an assignment and I'm asking you to write code that does the same thing, uh, I see no reason in making you retype it. Uh, so no, you can't cheat off yourself. Or, or rather, I allow you to cheat off yourself or, or however you want to word it. Okay. Anything else? Okay, let's start talking about Scala. Like I said at the, at the top of this, we're mostly going to rip through the syntax of Scala, and where else better to start in a programming class than Hello World. So this is Hello World in Scala. Uh, a bit more complicated than Python or JavaScript, those of you coming from 115, those of you coming from AP, uh, AP Computer Science, this probably doesn't scare you at all because it's very similar to how Java does things with a lot of overhead. But there's a lot more than just saying print hello world or hello Python, uh, console.log, hello JavaScript. It's a little bit more involved in Scala. So let's take a look at this overhead and pick this apart line by line. So first, the package declaration. A package declaration is saying where this code lives in the structure of your overall project. If you clone the examples repo and take a look at the code that I have in there, you'll notice that this code is in a directory named SRC, which stands for source, which is where all of your code will go, slash LO1 program execution slash Scala. And that directory, other than the source directory, 
is going to map directly to the package for that code. So the package declaration you can think of as being, it's going to be annoying, uh, you can think of as being the directory where this code lives. Scala, uh, in general, this will always map to the directory structure, the package and the directory structure. So all the packages in code that I give you is going to match the directory where that code lives. Scala does not strictly enforce that. So those of you coming from Java, um, you know that Java does strictly enforce that. You have to match. The package structure has to match the directory structure. And, uh, and you'll get errors and things won't work if you don't. Uh, Scala is a little looser on that. Uh, but I will still enforce that with any code that I show you this semester. The directory structure will match the package structure. So you can think of package as directory. Then we're going to create an object. All code in Scala has to be contained in an object. Anything that happens in Scala has to be contained in an object. Later on in the semester, we'll introduce classes, but you can't use those classes until you create objects from those classes. Everything has to be in an object for it to be able to do anything. So we're going to create an object named hello because we have to. I'm going to name it hello. Uh, you can name objects whatever you want for the most part. Uh, but the object name should match the file name of that code. So I have an object named hello. I'm going to put that in a file named hello.scala. So my full path of how to find this code is going to be in the directory matching the package name and a file matching the object name. So this is where you can find this exact code in the examples repo. So if you open up the examples repo and you want to follow whatever code I'm showing in lecture at the time, you can look at my package declaration and the object name and find exactly where that code is. Of course, later in the semester, I'll, I'll stop putting the package uh, declarations. You'll be able, I'm confident you'll be able to find the code anyway. Um, And an object, oh yeah, what an object actually is. An object is basically a container that's going to store variables and functions. But whenever we put a function inside an object, we're going to call it a method. So whenever I say method, which most of what we'll look at, if not all of what we'll look at in this course, will be methods and not functions. So, but when I say method, if you just want to pretend that I said function, not going to hold that against you. It would be perfectly fine. you get, get away with that uh, completely. But when I say method, uh, all your knowledge of functions will transfer over to that. There is a nuanced point that we'll talk about later. There is an actual difference between functions and methods. Um, but that's not something we, something we don't have to talk about until OOP, until we get to learning objective two. Then we have a method. This is what we call our main method. Our main method is going to be declared by saying def, main, args, array of strings, unit, with some colons in there, a bunch of stuff that a lot of that syntax will understand by the end of this lecture. But right now, I'm just going to say you have to have this if you want to write a Scala program that runs. So in an object, if you want any code to run, if you want it to be a Scala program, you have to have a main method. So you take this chunk of code, and you say equals and then some braces and define your main method. Whatever's inside the braces, that's the code that's going to execute when you run this program. And if you don't have a main method or if your main method is named like main with a capital M or it doesn't take an array of strings as a parameter, uh, your program doesn't run. So you have to have this exact thing, a method named main, array of strings, unit, all of that has to be there. The only thing that can change a little bit is this args. This is a variable name, so you can name it whatever you want. We typically name it args, but that, can, uh, that name can change. But there's no reason to change it. And then finally, with all that overhead, we can start writing code that's going to run. Uh, this program, of course, doesn't really do anything interesting. It's just going to print hello Scala to the console, and that's it. All right, any questions on this? So far, this is our first of three examples today. What's up? Uh, uh, you can just put a number in the, the print line method. So print line will take any type and then call to string on it is technically what's going on under the hood. 
So it'll convert anything you give it into a string and then print that out to the screen. So even giving it a string here, there's actually a, a redundant method call of calling to string on a string to convert the string to a string behind the scenes. But we can give it whatever we want. I could say print line 3.0 and it'll print that to the screen as well without quotes. Yes? Is main a keyword? No, main is the name of that method, but Scala will look for a method exactly named main when it goes to run your program. So it's not a keyword, but it does have to be exactly a lowercase m-a-i-n. Yeah. So the equal sign, so this is our method. Uh, my next example, go into this a little bit more, but this is the method declaration, or the method header, and then we're going to say its definition is this. This is the code that should execute when this method is called. So the equal sign separates the header from the body of a method. I don't know why it has to be there, to be honest. Most languages don't, don't need any symbol there, but Scala says, no, put an equal sign there. I'm sure there's a, a wonderfully good reason, but I just don't know what it is. All right, so that's our basic structure of a program. Let's start talking about some, uh, some module one and two topics from 115. Methods and variables. I'm gonna start with methods instead of variables. Uh, so this is the next program we're gonna look at. And I'm confident in every one of you that not seeing Scala at all, you could look at this program and figure out what it does and generally know, understand like what the code is doing and how it's getting to where it's going. We're creating a variable named x with the value seven. Calling this method multiply by two, which as the name implies, is going to multiply the input by two. Result should have the value 14, and then we're gonna print 14 to the screen. So I, I believe that anyone could follow that and figure out what it, what it does, but I wanna focus on all the syntax here, all the stuff especially that you haven't seen in other languages that we will see in Scala, so that you could write code like this. I want you to get to the point where if I said, write a method that multiplies the input by two, that you'd be able to write that. Which you wouldn't be able to do without seeing Scala ever before. So this is how we're going to define a method. We did define the main method in the previous example, but I didn't really talk about all the parts to it. Now I want to talk about the parts of how we're going to define a method. First, we're gonna start with the keyword def, to define, short for define a method. We're going to give the name of the method we're going to give the parameter list, in this case just one parameter, and we're going to give a return type. So a lot of that is familiar from like any language that you come from. The, uh, some keyword that's going to define a method, the name of the method, the input name, and a parameter list. Those should all be, be familiar, but we got a few extra things here that are uh, Scala specific, but not necessarily specific only to Scala. There are a lot of languages called strongly typed languages that are going to make us add in these types. So in Scala and many other languages, but not JavaScript and Python, one of the reasons we use those languages for 115, we don't have to talk about this stuff, is that you have to declare the type of all your parameters when you define a method. So it's not enough to just say this method multiplied by two takes one parameter and I'm gonna name it input. We have to specify what type input is going to be, in this case a double, which means it's going to be a floating point value, uh, which would be uh, equivalent to a float in Python or a number in JavaScript with a decimal portion. So double is going to be our num numeric values that can have a decimal portion. In this example, I only use whole numbers, but with a double, I can have decimal portions. I could call this with 7.5, for example. We're going to specify the type by using a colon. So we're gonna say the name of the parameter, which is true for any language, you have to name your parameters, a colon, and then the type of that parameter. So I'm saying there's going to be one parameter, its name is input, and its type is double. That means whenever I call this method, I have to call it with a value of type double. If I don't, Scala gets mad at me and things break. 
So Scala will enforce these types. When you say it takes a double, it better take a double. X here better be a double, which it happens to be. The next thing, we have another type. After the parameter list, we have another colon and then another type. And this is going to be the return type of the method. I'm saying this method returns a double. And whenever this method is called, whatever code is in the body of this method, it has to return a double. That's a contract that I make in with Scala. When I say the return type is double, I'm saying I guarantee you this method is going to return a double, no matter what. That bond can't be broken. You have to return a double. We have the equal sign separating the, the header. Do have a slide for that? Uh, an equal sign separating the header of the method and the body of the method. The body of the method will be in braces. White space doesn't matter the way it does in Python. We're going to use the more JavaScript flavor and have braces to define where the method starts and ends. We're not just going to indent uh, like Python does. Python's pretty unique in that. It's one of the only languages that cares about white space. Uh, I, I'll say the only mainstream language that cares about white space that much. Uh, most languages are going to do it the JavaScript way, where you have braces to specify the start and end of a block of code. Now the the big difference, you should be noticing the distinct lack of a return keyword. In Scala, you don't have to use the return keyword. In fact, it's discouraged in the Scala community to use return at all. We don't like using the return keyword at all uh, in, in uh, Scala circles. Instead, what's, uh, there's, oh, by the way, there still is a return keyword in Scala. If you do use the return keyword, I'm not going to hold it against you. You'll be perfectly fine. You can use it on your homeworks. But it is discouraged in the language. To use the language the, uh, the way the community likes it to be used, you wouldn't use the word return. Uh, instead, what's returned from a Scala method is the value of the last expression that's evaluated while that method executes. So whatever the last expression that's evaluated throughout the execution of that method, whatever value that resolves to, that's what's returned. For this method, pretty simple for our very first method, there's only one expression. So we know what the last expression is going to be. It's going to be this one, input times two. It's an expression that takes two doubles. So the input is guaranteed to be of type double. And 2.0 is going to be of type double uh, because I have a numeric literal with a decimal portion. So that will be a double. I don't know if that makes sense yet. Right? Uh, we'll talk about different types on, on Friday if, the, if that doesn't make complete sense. But uh, I have a decimal portion, so that will be a double. So I have a double times a double. That's going to return a double. So this evaluates to a double, which matches my return type. So everything's nice and happy with this, uh, with this example. So we have one expression that evaluates to a double, matches our return type, and that's what's going to be returned when this method calls, when this method executes. The last expression that's evaluated, whatever value it evaluates to, that's what's returned. And if that type doesn't match the return type, you're going to get errors and Scott is going to get all mad. Yeah. Uh, we do, but it's called unit in uh, Scala. So if we want a method that doesn't return anything, like the main method doesn't return anything, we use unit. Finally, variable declaration. Declare a variable, we're going to use the keyword var, short for variable, of course. Var is going to say, Scala, I'm about to declare a variable. In Scala, we must declare our variables. Scala won't let us get away without declaring them. Uh, for example, in Python, I would just say x equals 7, and Python would take care of the rest for me. Uh, in Scala, we have to specify explicitly that we're creating a brand new variable. So we'll say var. Name our variable. I want to create a brand new variable named x. And our variables, in addition to our parameters and our returns, 
Our variables also need a type, which we're going to specify with a colon. So I want a variable named x, and this variable is going to be of type double. When I say this variable is of type double, that variable can only ever store values of type double. Ever. Scala won't let us put a different value in there. If I later on in this program try to say x equals the string hello, I'm going to get an error. It's not going to work. It doesn't work. So this variable is of type double, and it can only ever store double. Yeah? No, you can't redefine the variable later on in the same code block. Like, I could have a variable named x in my method, and that would be fine. But if the next line I say var x again, I'll get a variable redeclaration error. Uh, in, so this is more similar to JavaScript, where you had to use let or const. Uh, we have to declare our variables with one of those keywords, except JavaScript, if you don't use let or const, it will work. It will have a little bit funnier behavior in certain cases, uh, but it'll still let you get away with it. Scala won't. If you don't have var here, if I just say x of type double equals 7, it's not going to work. You, you can't use a variable before it's declared. In most cases, I'll always specify the type of my variable in, my, in the lecture slides. So x, I'm very explicit. It's of type double. And I'm going to do that throughout the semester, except on rare occasions, sometimes I'll just forget. And I'll be like, oh, man, I forgot my variable type declaration. One ex exception is right here, where I'm intentionally not specifying the type of my variable. And I'll explain why in a sec. So first, to call a method, it's this syntax. Uh, I believe this is the syntax in like every programming language. If you've ever programmed with a function or method before, uh, it's the same syntax. The name of the method you want to call, and then the argument list. The arguments will be assigned to the parameters, and then the code is executed, and what's ever returned by the method will be returned. So we have x, which is 7. 7 times 2. That's the last expression. Resolves to 14. This will resolve to the double 14, 14.0. 14 now, that value is going to be assigned to this variable, this new variable I'm declaring called result. But I didn't tell Scala what type result is. But in this case, Scala can figure it out for us. Scala will infer the type of the variable. And it will infer that it should be a double because this method that we're calling we made a contract. We made a deal with Scala and said, that will only ever return a double. And Scala is enforcing that contract within that method. And it's going to rely on that contract outside of that method when we're calling it. So Scala says, hey, you didn't give me any type for the variable result. But look, it'll look on the right-hand side and it'll say, look, multiply by 2 can only ever in its lifetime return a double. I got this. Result has to be of type double. And Scala will infer that for us and let us get away with some shortcuts here. Uh, if you use uh, type inference like this and don't specify your types explicitly on your homework, uh, as long as you get away with it and your code works, you know, I don't care. Uh, you can take advantage of this. I won't in my slides just to, because I want my examples to be as explicit as possible. And I recommend that you do as well until you're very comfortable about what type Scala will infer to, because sometimes Scala will infer to a type that you weren't expecting and then things break down the road. Uh, or if you're not specifying your types because you don't actually know what type it's supposed to be, uh, if you come to me in office hours with a question like that, I will, I'll reiterate what I'm explaining in lecture right now. And I'll be like, look, at, let's talk about types and uh, hopefully, um, hopefully resolve the confusion. So I recommend adding your types whenever. Uh, whenever. But uh, if you don't want to and you want to take advantage of type inference, that's fine. All right, any questions on this example? Yeah. So for this one, you would do it the same syntax as the line above. We would say result colon double. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, uh, so I'll say method. So whenever a, what would be a function is declared inside an object, which will, uh, or a class later on in the semester, we call it a method. And that will apply to every single would-be function in Scala. Uh, so I'll just always call them methods in this class. Uh, they are the same as functions. There is one exception that we'll talk about when we start talking about classes and references in Learning Objective 2. Uh, the difference is there's an implicit parameter, which is a reference to the object. Uh, but that's something we don't have to worry about quite yet. But there, so suffice to know for now, there is a nuanced difference between methods and functions. But if you want to think of methods, what I'm calling methods, if you want to think of them as functions, because I, I want you to transfer all your 115 knowledge on functions over to methods. If you want to think about them as functions, it's perfectly fine. You'll get away with that. Yes? So, so Scala will know this returns a double because we specify the return type of double, but Scala will also enforce the return type of double. So if I returned, like if I just put a string here, a string literal, and that was my last expression, Scala will enforce this and say, yo, you, you told me you're going to return a double, and then you returned a string, and Scala's going to yell at us. Uh, so this is a strict contract that we're making with Scala, which Scala will enforce, and then Scala will also use it on the other side to say, look it, he told me, they told me it's going to be returning a double, and I enforced that with them when I checked their code for the method, so I can rely on this returning a double, and then infer that that variable must be of type double. So Scala's working on both ends for us there. But once we say this returns a double, Scala's doing a lot of work uh, after that fact once we say this will return a double. All right. More example, let's take a look at some conditionals. Just like the last two examples, even not seeing any Scala before in your life, I would be, uh, uh, I'd be confident that any of you can look at this code and figure out what it would do. Even if I didn't have the output right here, you'd still be able to figure out what's going on with this. Um, but very quickly anyway, very quickly, we have a method named compute size that takes a double and returns a string. We're going to call it three times and just print out the results. And this method has two boundaries, 60 and 30. And we're going to say any input that's above that upper bound is going to be large. Anything in between the bounds inclusive of the lower bound is going to be medium. And anything below that lower bound is going to be small. So just arbitrarily giving labels to, uh, to numbers in a certain range. I always think of this as weighing a package at the post office. Uh, you know, is this, should this be charged large, medium, or low shipping? I know that's not how packages actually work. They'll uh, charge you based on uh, the weight and stuff. Uh, but in general, just uh, determining if a value is large, medium, or small. With, of course, 70 being large, 50 being medium, 10 being small. So that's what it does, but let's focus on the Scala syntax. Uh, we know about methods, compute size takes a double and returns a string. Uh, we got that stuff down. Let's look at our next two variable declarations. With these ones, I use the keyword val instead of var. Technically, val is creating a value. I'll often call my values variables just because I think it sounds weird calling them values for no other reason than that. Uh, saying create a value named large of type double that stores the value 60. It's weird saying value twice like that. I don't know. I just don't like it, maybe that's just me. Uh, but I'll often call values variables anyway, even though they're values. So the value stored in a value, again, that's why I don't like it. A val the value stored in a value can't change. I can't later on in this code say large equals, uh, large equals 70. I'll get a, re a reassignment to a val error and things won't work. So val, whenever I can, I like to use val just to make it more clear that I don't expect these values to change. I don't expect the, the values of these boundaries to change during the execution of a program. It doesn't quite make sense for this application. So whenever I can, I'm going to use val instead of var if I don't expect the value to change at all. Uh, if you use var for everything, again, I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm not going to care. You can use that on your homeworks. Just use var for everything. 
Uh, there used to be cases where I restricted you to Veil. I don't believe there are any of those left in the course, um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your outlook. I think it's unfortunate, but, um, but if you use var, that's fine. Uh, from JavaScript, the JavaScript comparison, Veil is const, var is let. So if you just want to transfer that knowledge over, that's the mapping. And we have our first conditional. I don't have much to say about the syntax of a condi the conditionals. They're, it's the same syntax as just about every language except Python. Uh, Python has a little bit different syntax, but it'll match your JavaScript, or if you're coming from Java, it'll match that syntax. If you're coming from C++, it'll match that syntax. You all have seen this syntax before, pretty much no matter what background you have, unless somehow you came from a Python-only background, which I guess is possible. Um, so if some Boolean expression, if that's true, execute this block of code. If it's false, move on to the next clause. Else if, we have another conditional. If this is true, execute this block. If both of these are false, execute the else. Um, not much to say there. But what I do want to talk about is the Scala-specific thing. So I mentioned that the last expression that's evaluated while a method executes the, whatever that method, uh, whatever that expression evaluates to, that's the return value of that method call. In the first example, that was pretty clear. There was only one expression total in the method, but even if there were like five lines of code and they were all sequential code with no control flow, just the last one, uh, the last one that's written in the method, that's what's returned. It would be pretty straightforward. But here we have a case where it's not extremely clear what the last expression is because the last expression that's evaluated in the call of this method is determined by the conditional. So this conditional is controlling what the last expression is. Based on what our Boolean expressions evaluate to, the last expression is either the string literal large, the string literal medium, or the string literal small. So depending on what those are, so for example, when 70 is the input, this Boolean expression is true. This code block executes, evaluates this string literal, which just evaluates to itself, to its own value. And then the method is over. We reach the closing brace. So the last expression that was evaluated was large. That's what's going to be returned. Now, you don't have to do this. I, I like to show off this trick uh, right from the start uh, because it reinforces what we learned about methods, how they're going to return the last expression. Uh, if you do use this trick, I have a few words of caution for you, though. You, if, your last, uh, if your last thing that your method does is a Boolean expression, you're using that to control what code is going to be the return value. One, you have to have an else statement. Scala is going to enforce this return type. And if it can't determine that every single input your method could possibly have is always going to result in the last expression evaluating to that type, then it's not going to be happy. Scala's not going to let you do that. So if you don't have an else, Scala's going to say, well, what if both of these are false and we're not, evalu we're not evaluating an expression that results in a string? So it's going to be mad. You have to have your else if you're going to do this. Uh, to make sure that every path through your method always results in the last expression being resolving to a string. You also can't have anything after the conditional. I see that in office hours fairly often. If you're using this trick and you have a line of code after the conditional, you want to just have like a debugging print statement. You want to say like print, in, print line input. Uh, that's going to mess things up because now the last thing that happens in your method, the last expression that's evaluated, is printing to the screen, which doesn't evaluate to anything. It evaluates to unit, and you're going to get the error of uh, expected double found unit type mismatch. Can't do anything with this, and Scala won't run your code. So you have to make sure that no matter how you get through your method, the last thing that happens is always matching the return type. In uh, the third thing, and I knew there was one more, I was blanking on it. Every block of code in your conditional, all three of these blocks of code all have to 
have a string literal as the last expression that's evaluated. If one of these, like if just the medium one had like a print statement after the medium or var x equals seven or whatever, anything after that string literal, now the string literal isn't the last thing that happens and you're not always returning a string. You'll get type mismatch. Uh, I wanted a string and you gave me unit. Um, if you see that error, make sure that the last thing your method is doing is resolving to something of that return type. Okay, any questions on this example? Parameters should be brackets. What do you mean? The, the conditions will be, in, the Boolean expressions will be in parentheses, and then the block of code corresponding to that condition will be in braces. Nothing in chat. No questions? Yes. Ooh, good question. I actually don't know for sure. I always put my, my braces in my conditionals. I know in a lot of languages, if it's one line, you can put it. Uh, I forget exactly how Scala does it out the time I had. All right, so we got one last thing. We have our first of many lecture questions. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> so if you go to the top of the course website, we're going to do our first lecture question today. Um, if you go to the top of the course website, you have that Autolab link. You should all be added to Autolab unless you uh, added the course like earlier today. Uh, if you did, let me know, email me, we'll get it taken care of. Um, but go into Autolab and you'll see the submission for the first lecture question. I always get nervous when it takes a while. Uh, for Wednesday, August 31st, when you get here, Scroll down a little bit and you'll see just the five choices, A, B, D, C, or E. What you do is select whatever your choice is, affirm that you didn't cheat, and then submit. So that's how we're going to do the lecture questions this year. They are not, despite being on Autolab, they are not auto graded. I, I'll process them uh, either tonight or tomorrow. But that's how we do lecture questions. And without further ado, let's lecture question it up. There's our first lecture question. Lecture questions will almost always be the very last thing I do in lecture. And once you submit the question, you're free to go. That's all I got for you. Uh, have fun. I'll see everyone Friday. <laughs>